Hello, fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. Welcome to your horoscope for the week of January 26, 2020. I am your astrologer, Nadia Shaw. Thank you for being here. What an amazing week it is. We have an active and fabulous sky playing out for us right now. And it is this week that does feature a beautiful once a year alignment, or rather meeting in the sky of Venus and Neptune. And that would be very beautiful, very fantastical. Uh, and it would be very spiritual and inspired if it wasn't for the fact that Mars is speaking to this configuration intention. It is that fact that this becomes a larger configuration thanks to Mars that changes the energy and changes the game considerably. Now, it was uh, very recently, this past week actually, there's been so much going on, everything moves so quickly or has felt like it's been moving so quickly uh, that I was in New York City three nights, three days of events back to back to back. And uh, at the event that I did at the Theosophical Society of New York, uh, really such a beautiful crowd, such a loving crowd. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation and I was able to have private moments with many people there. And I remember talking to somebody in particular about this brilliant book uh, that is called Eros and Pathos, Shades of Love and Suffering. I am sure I will pronounce the author's name wrong, so I'll put it somewhere on the screen. But I read this book years ago and it made such an impression on me for its brilliance and for its simplicity. So one of the central ideas in this book is that to love is to be intimately connected to the notion of loss. In fact, love and loss go together. You cannot love without truly understanding that at some point there is going to be a sense of loss as well. And it is by reconciling the two, by allowing the two to find peace, to be next to each other and to be still next to each other, well, we are that much more able to love that much more fully and be changed by love that much more for the better. And of course, I was talking about it in the context of my dog, but as I was thinking about the sky this week, I thought how perfect a symbolism, how perfect an analogy. Venus is said to be exalted in the sign of Pisces. And what that means is she's able to bring forward her highest qualities with that much more ease. And her higher qualities include universal love, compassion, a heightened sense of beauty, universal beauty as well. And the pleasure of Venus, the spiritual pleasure of Venus is highlighted here also. Now with Venus meeting Neptune in the sky, and Neptune is in its home sign of Pisces, already in a strong position, well, the two of them end up magnifying each other's energies that much more. The energy of uh, romantic compassion is exemplified and becomes universal communion. The energies of spiritual bliss that is found with Neptune becomes that much more embodied. Romantic bliss is found, especially as these two join forces. So it is Neptunian energy and Venusian energy, very strong at this time, an energy of glamour, an energy of bliss and of beauty, an energy of full ownership of our spiritual power and what it is that we wish to project into the world, what it is that we wish to create in the world, being swept up by emotion, by ideas, by flights of fancy. All of that is magnified when Neptune meets Venus in the sky as they will now. However, Mars is a very different energy. It is Venus and Mars that are considered a kind of counter to each other. And in that way, they end up actually complementing each other. They are speaking in a connection called a square. And a square is one of tension. Venus and Mars square can also be sparks. It can be motivation. But Neptune in the middle of this configuration well, that ends up changing the energy considerably.
Mars right now, Mars considered a very fiery planet, especially in modern astrology as the ruler of Aries. But it is also Mars in a fire sign right now, in the sign of Sagittarius that is speaking to Neptune and to Venus simultaneously. This energy is going to peak between Monday and Wednesday, but really we will be feeling this energy as we step into the week. And it is going to be once we get past the middle of the week that the energy starts to dissipate considerably. But it is going to be dominant for much of this week and the first half of the week in particular. So we can think of this as one uh, larger configuration, a concentration of energy that is going to stay with us as we start the week and into the first half of the week. So it is Mars representing fire and in a fire sign with Neptune, God of the seas, meeting Venus, already exalted both of these energies in a water sign. So what happens when water meets fire? Well, water puts fire out, right? It is ultimately water that has a way of dampening fire, making fire mute even. Another interesting thing to take into consideration, both Sagittarius and Pisces are ruled by the planet Jupiter. They both have uh, elements to them of uh, religiosity, of spirituality, of faith, of belief, of spiritual values as well. Both want to believe in something. Both of these signs speak to someone who is not only a seeker, but also a believer someone looking for a spiritual experience. They just go about it in very different ways. And so Jupiter is the ancient ruling planet of Pisces. In the modern context though, we have Neptune as the modern ruling planet of Pisces. Still that Jupiterian connection remains. And Sagittarius of course has the ruling planet Jupiter as well. So the fact that both of these signs are lit up in notable ways right now, both of these signs speaking to each other because of the planetary alignments that are transpiring, well, it speaks very strongly to us, our faith, our belief, our desire for bliss, but then having to look at experience, having to look at things on a level of our instant reaction, of our impulses even. We may have an ideal vision of what we want to create, what beauty we want to put in the world and what compassion means. But what is it that our instincts lead us to do? What is it that is sort of automatically programmed within us? What are our immediate reactions and how do we bring healing energy to that? How is it that we can reconcile the two? That's a little bit more challenging under this sky. And so that brings me back to Eros and Pathos, Shades of Love and Suffering. When we have a square, this is a connection of tension, but also great motivation. Squares get things done. That's the thing with them. When I was a young baby astrologer starting out and I was uh, looking at charts, really diving into charts for the very first time, I remember that I, uh, at the time, we didn't really have access to the internet like now, and I would have to go to the New Age bookstore and request celebrity charts. And they had these uh, big books uh, of Astro Data Bank, where you can actually look up celebrity charts in there as well. And if they weren't there, then you could request them. Very often they were in uh, programs that had to be, uh, the charts had to be ordered by people who had those programs already. And so I remember ordering the charts of some of the most famous people at the time. Like we're talking the 90s, the early 90s, the mid 90s, right around there. Fully expecting to see trines and grand trines. Shocked beyond belief, I tell you, when I saw squares, lots of squares. I saw grand crosses, which is essentially a larger configuration of squares. And that is when I started to appreciate and to understand that squares represent motivation. Without the squares, people are just kind of laying back, allowing life to happen. If you feel yourself to be 
in a state of blessings and bliss, if you feel like all is right in your world, that's great, right? That's a great feeling. That's a feeling that a lot of us uh, work towards and even yearn for. But those of us who do yearn for that, well, chances are we have a lot of squares in our chart. That's why we're yearning for it. But if you already feel that all is well, chances are you're not as motivated to do the work, to feel better, to make things well, because you already feel pretty good. And so squares, yes, they represent action. They get things done. And in the context of a week like this, they also represent an element of reconciliation whether that is between different ideologies, between our spiritual experiences and our spiritual values, our faith and uh, what we desire to feel and what we actually are feeling. There is going to be this point, this work that we are inspired to do to find that point of reconciliation. But it isn't just about faith, it's also about love. Eros and pathos, shades of love and suffering. What is it that love is meant to feel like for us? What is it that love in practice actually looks like? Where is it that we feel empowered in love and we're taking action and we're moving ourselves, propelling ourselves forward towards connection? And where is it that our desire for bliss found in another cannot be met? This is going to be part of the energies that we're being asked to bring reconciliation to. Now, there's also the, the context of faith, right? There is this belief that faith is healthiest when it questions itself. And when faith is healthy, it wanes. And what I mean by that is we have seen throughout history, certainly throughout the ages, throughout the world, we have seen what happens when faith does not question itself. What brutality can arise from that? So I'm thinking specifically having, you know, of course, having a home in Mexico. Right now I'm in Canada at my parents' house, but I feel a very strong bond and a strong tie to Mexico. I've been there for seven years now. I've lived there recently coming off a cruise where uh, we did excursions, where we learned that much more about the spiritual experience, the historical experience of the Mayan people. And I'm thinking about uh, the conquerors, the conquistadors, and how in their faith and in their belief that they were going out to convert people and they were doing something right and they were doing something righteous really wrecked a lot of havoc and brought great destruction uh, to a people, to a culture uh, that had tremendous wisdom, that had tremendous beauty. One of the things I remember learning many years ago that actually hurt me very deeply was the burning of books that took place. The conquistadors actually burned a lot of books that held the Mayan wisdom in it. And so a lot of the wisdom that survives to this day is largely because of oral tradition, because of a commitment to keep the wisdom going, but there's a whole lot of wisdom there that has been lost to us, possibly forever. And there's sadness because of that. I feel a loss because of that. Mexico is an adopted home to me. I don't have an ancestral connection to Mexico, but I feel a bond to it on a spiritual level, which is why it has become home to me. And we have many examples just like this throughout history, but even in modern times as well. We can think about when we see the destruction of uh, religious sites, of cultural sites, how much it hurts across the world, how much it feels like something of our human history, the human legacy we hold, how much of that becomes lost whenever there is destruction that happens to spiritual places, to spiritual monuments, when it comes from, and even though it comes from, a place and a space and a people who are so in a faith that they are not questioning. Faith that is not questioned 
is not healthy. But also a faith that never wanes is not healthy as well. When faith wanes, when we have those moments when we want to be filled with faith or we want to feel a connection, but we don't, right? No matter what we're doing, we're in a space where we're either in so much sadness or so much pain, spiritual pain, we're in doubt, we're in uncertainty, that it's hard to feel that connection to spirit. It's hard to feel that connection to the divine within us, perhaps even the divine in each other. That is when faith wanes, but it is in those moments that we actually do the work that faith requires, that we actually show something of what our faith is actually made of, that makes those times of strong faith that much stronger. We cannot know how strong faith can be without knowing its converse, without knowing those moments when our faith feels weak. They go hand in hand if they're going to be strong, if they're going to be healthy. Times of waning faith and times of waxing faith. Times when our faith feels like it is lagging and longing and times when our faith feels certain and strong and growing and fully embodied. This may very well be a contrast that all of us have in one way or another. Uh, whether it is much more personal in terms of what's happening with our relationships with the people and how it is we are trying to reconcile that sense of uh, love and loss and how it is that they have to work together and sit together or whether it is on a level of faith and the faith we feel and how it is that we can reconcile moments of waning faith, like I do think some of us may be feeling at this time. And how is it that we can reconcile conflicting ideologies, conflicting messages as well? Mars is a planet that represents our um, survival instinct, but it's also the very first emotional states that we got used to dwelling in before we could even speak. It is what is most familiar on a very visceral level. And in that way, it is also our earliest conditioning that is indicated by Mars. And so where it is that we find ourselves kind of viscerally triggered, even though we know better, even though we hold higher ideals, even though we believe that compassion and understanding should be the way in which we interact with the world and understand each other. At the same time, we also have those visceral reactions that are rooted very, very deeply in our psyche, that are rooted in our conditioning where even though we believe in the equality and the equalness of all people, no matter what your race or ethnicity uh, or your religious background may be, at the same time, we have that conditioning. Sometimes it does go all the way back to childhood. Sometimes it's more about what we've been conditioned through consistent messaging again and again, whether you wanna call it propaganda or otherwise but we get these messages again and again about the other and what the other is. And that in turn can lend itself to a visceral reaction that we don't always control. We don't always realize how deep that messaging actually goes and how deeply some part of us has taken it on. Well, it is this sky right now that is going to invite us to consider this, that is going to invite us to look at ourselves, our own reactions, where it is that we want to lash out almost automatically. It might be personal. It might be more global. It might be directed at, you know, kind of anonymous others, people of different uh, social locations or demographics, but it might be a lot more personal. It might be directed at a particular person who did you a particular wrong. How is it that we take that more hurt part of us? Mars is also childhood for a reason. Like I said, earliest uh, conditioning, but it's our childish responses ultimately. So how is it that we don't respond as children, but instead hold ourselves to our higher values? That response, that adrenaline, that reaction, there's an addictive quality to it. It takes diligence to decide that we're going to hold ourselves to those higher ideals, 
even when we can't feel it. We have faith, but we wish we could feel more connected, but we don't. We want to love and have that universal love for each other and perhaps for a specific person, but it's hard to feel it sometimes. It takes work to feel it sometimes. Are we willing to do the work? How committed are we to those ideals? Well, that work may very well show up for us now. So whether it is that you are one of those people experiencing these lessons within love, within the context of an intimate relationship or within the context of a longing for love, longing for a particular person where it feels like there has been that loss. Whether it is that these lessons are playing out more globally, more universally, more in terms of groups, we have a real opportunity here now to integrate. We have a real opportunity here now to work on our faith, to ensure that our faith is strong, that our faith is grounded, that our faith is certain. Even if we don't feel it right away, we can get there. I spoke about the conquistadors just a moment ago, and I do want to say, and I want to emphasize that there are assertions and there is a theory that may very well be true. There is a belief that may very well be true that the conquistadors that were going out there to convert people, they truly believed they were doing the right thing. They truly believed that uh, they were coming upon people who didn't realize they were doing something wrong, uh, doing something that ultimately was not aligned with uh, the Jesus or the Christ or the, the Catholic principles that they understood, that they believed were right. They believed that they were actually saving these people, that they were bringing salvation. And that is part of, if not the most important motivation to their actions. I don't want to judge what somebody did or why they did it, but we can look at outcomes today. We can look at the fact that there is this sense of loss now and that there has been this sense of people wanting to reclaim what was lost. And it's hard. It cannot be reclaimed without taking into consideration a modern context, without utilizing modern tools, and without also taking into consideration that we are now modern people. So how is it that we can reclaim and regain knowledge that has felt lost and we can now document it again? Those new documentations can only be understood in the modern context and will never be exactly what they were before. Regardless of motivations, and I'm, of course, I'm not saying anybody right now or alive today or any faith or any, you know, any background is good or bad or otherwise. But what I am saying is that there may be a sense of loss it might go back very, very far. It might be for some out there. This is Pisces energy after all. It is about connection and communion. It's about the lives that we have felt that we bring into this life. And so some of that loss may very well be connected to our past lives and what we experienced before. And whether or not we can fully intellectualize it, we might be feeling it. I think about... Um, there's a theory called ancestral memory or uh, sort of the emotions that we hold in our DNA. And there's this belief that when we do the work to heal ourselves, we are actually healing on that level of ancestral DNA. We are going way back and we are healing generations by working on our healing today by working to find that sense of, of integration and unity within ourselves, within our spirit, by working to be at peace with ourselves and our choices and our lives and our present, it is then that we're actually able to heal not only the past, but then we are able to be that much stronger stewards for the future of our ancestral lines. 
that much more stronger stewards for the descendants that have yet to come. Now, when I talk about ancestry, I also want to say I don't just mean physical ancestry. Yes, we can say our uh, ancestral DNA that would be connected to our physical ancestry. But anytime we align with a system of thought, a philosophical school, a spiritual tradition, we are ultimately carrying forward some lineage. We are ultimately aligning ourselves with ancestors, spiritual ancestors, intellectual ancestors, ancestors in thought, in deed, in action. And by aligning with them, we become their descendants. We become a part of what it is that they desired not only to leave behind, but what is now being carried forward, what is made modern thanks to us thanks to our development, our embodiment, and our willingness to do the work today. It is this week that has this very interesting start, right? This start that can feel like things are in flux and they are in flow, like we're questioning. Some people may be feeling like they are mourning and they may not be able to put a finger on why or what. And so it is really important to be kind and gentle to everyone you meet. All of us in some way are experiencing a loss, a loss of some illusion, a loss of some hope, a loss of something that we held high, that we saw as ideal and are now realizing that maybe it isn't so. But it is in that space when we're willing to acknowledge the loss that love can actually happen. And this is why in Eros and Pathos, they talk about how it is ultimately in reconciling love and loss, sitting next to each other peacefully, that we're able to love that much more fully. It is in acknowledging the loss now of whatever that may be, a dream, a hope, a role model, a, a, a fantasy. It is by being willing to acknowledge that loss and being willing to feel it, being willing to mourn it, that we then transform the energy, that we then become true stewards of love, love for ourselves, love for each other, and love for our journey. We are then able to actually be stewards of compassion, not only more effectively, but more honestly than we knew we could be before. What I love about this week for us, well, look, I do love that this energy is ultimately very compartmentalized. It is a lot, it's pretty intense. A lot of us are gonna be feeling it quite deeply. But others of us may find that it's just a moment. It comes and it goes. It washes through us, if you will. Regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, this energy ultimately peaks in the early part of the week. It is Monday to Wednesday that you can consider it kind of a block of energy playing out. Once we move past that very quickly, the energy will start to dissipate. And next week is a really big week. It is next week that we are going to have not only Mercury moving into shadow, but Venus will make supportive and harmonious connections to Saturn and Pluto. Of course, I'll be here to talk about it when we get there and talk about it every step of the way. But what that tells me is that the uncertainty, the illusions, the delusions, the release, the loss, the longing of now will ultimately give way to a much stronger future, a much stronger sense of self and a much stronger and clearer and more powerful commitment to love that is set to find us for some before the week is even over. And as we get to the very end of the week, we'll start feeling that harmonious and empowered energy. It is now though, and there is wisdom now in just being where we are in feeling what we do and allowing ourselves to acknowledge when it is that we don't have the answer. As Eckhart Tolle said, to be comfortable with uncertainty, because when it is that we allow ourselves to be comfortable with uncertainty, infinite possibilities open up to us. Those infinite possibilities are right around the corner. You might not even have to wait until we get into next week 
before those infinite possibilities start to open up. But it is now, in this time, in this space, that you are allowed to feel whatever you do. And whatever it is that you feel, don't judge it. Let it be what it needs to be. And it is in acceptance that we find love. It is in the acceptance of all the range of emotion that can be on offer now that we find genuine and authentic beauty within ourselves and in each other. Well, thank you so much for watching. What do you love about this week? Let me know in the comments below. I love reading you guys. And of course, if you want to know how all this wonderful stuff this week speaks to you and your sign, log on to NadiaShaw.com. Sign up to be one of my superstars. Superstars get expanded exclusive video scopes each and every week, unlimited access to special horoscopes and more. All of this in the superstar space. I look forward to meeting you there. It felt really good to do a proper weekly video, I tell you. <laughs> I've had just so much stuff going on and I will tell you the truth, I have been burning the candle at both ends. I have been truly exhausted the last few weeks and I still am, if I'm very honest with you, if I'm very straightforward, I still am. I'm really looking forward to getting enough sleep while I'm at my parents' house. Um, but it just felt really good. I made a commitment to myself that I was going to be here and be present and go deep with uh, the astrological symbols. It is uh, so renewing to me to be able to do that. And so thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I had uh, to make some edit. I had to make some corrections uh, with the video that I did last week. And I... I do this live with my superstars every month at the new moon. We do this hangout and meditation together. And I really dived in and explained everything uh, to them. And so you have my apologies for the first video going up with some errors in it. But they were quickly corrected. And I thank you guys so much for sticking with me, for your love, for your patience with me, for your trust in my interpretation of the sky. Just thank you. Thank you so much for it. I do value you as my audience so very much. So Synchronicity University has already begun. We are already in full swing. Earlier today, we had uh, a class on Venus take place. And I believe that that class is already ready for download at synchronicityuniversity.com. Uh, so we looked at Venus through the signs and houses. Immediately, I've been getting a lot of great feedback. So I'm so glad people enjoyed that. Next week, we'll be looking at Pluto in aspect to planets and chart points. So it's basically part two of Pluto. Last session we did Pluto through the signs and houses. Now we'll be looking at Pluto in aspect to planets and chart points. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. The week after we'll have Jupiter in aspect, and then we'll have a class on uh, lunar mansions and then another on chart rulership. So there's a lot coming up in the winter session of 2020 of Synchronicity University. Join us for one class, join us for all classes. You would be very welcome indeed. Links are in the description below. I look forward to meeting you in class. Very recently, I had a bunch of truly phenomenal events uh, taking place. I've been on the road. Like I said, I think it's the third time I'm saying it. I'm at my parents' house, I'm in Canada. It's cold, yes, but I'm really, really glad uh, to be here. Uh, for all the reasons that people like visiting their parents, right? But um, I had some brilliant experiences and I met incredible people and I thank each and every one of you. Thank you to coming out, uh, whether you were on the cruise with me and we shared a moment or whether it was that you were at one of my three events in New York City. Um, the event that I had at the New York Theosophical Society my goodness, there was so much love in that room. We had a packed house, a sold out crowd. And I thank you guys so much for being there. It really was a dream come true for me. I did a panel event as well that I did want to mention. Brilliant astrologers on uh, that panel. In particular, though, I wanted to mention two astrologers that really stood out to me. One was Mecca Woods. Uh, she really is doing incredible things in astrology. I hope that you'll check her out and learn more about her. The other was Colin Bedell. Uh, you can find him at Queer Cosmos on Instagram. Queer Cosmos, that's where I interact with him most. 
really such a, a, a loving and brilliant presence and soul. And I really loved getting to know him. I found so much wisdom and strength in him. And so I want to send a special shout out uh, to Colin. Thank you so much for being there, for being there for me and with me. It truly was such a pleasure. And I hope that you will check him out as well at Queer Cosmos uh, on Instagram. Check out my books. My books are back here. I love that I'm able to do this, to have them sort of propped up here. Um, of course, my uh, true book, my long established book, Astrology Realized is here. The Body and the Cosmos, which was uh, released in December, uh, and it was a number one new release on Amazon in New Age Astrology books. Uh, and so it's continued to get amazing feedback. Thank you so much for that. And my upcoming book, uh, Prayers to the Sky, advanced copies are going out very soon. Uh, and more information about how you can get that will be forthcoming. Uh, but thank you. Thank you so much for supporting my books, for your enthusiasm, for finding value in them. It does mean so much to me. Uh, so thank you for that. I've got lots of live events coming up as well. You'd think I would take a break. I am going to get a little break, actually. I'll be in um, back at home in Mexico very soon. I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait to hug Biggie. I have a nanny cam and on my phone to be honest. And a lot of people who met me over my different events that I had over the last few weeks, I showed them my nanny cam. I actually opened up the app and I said, look at what Biggie is doing right now. So I can't wait to see Biggie and hug Biggie once again. And I'm looking forward to just being in my home and my adopted home of Mexico again very soon. Um, but then I'll be on the road in March. And so at the end of March, I will be in Istanbul. The beginning of April, I will be in uh, Thailand, in Bangkok. And then fast forward, May will be the next month where there's a whole lot going on. Uh, I will be in four different cities. I'll be doing a, a very special event with world-renowned astrologers in Costa Rica as part of astrologyrisingcostarica.com. I would encourage you to go onto that website and see just how phenomenal an event this is. It has a very busy schedule. We are going to have the resort all to ourselves. Our host and organizer is Kaipacha. Kaipacha is huge on YouTube as well. And it really is going to be this immersive experience with world-renowned astrologers, including the great Rick Levine, one of my very favorite people. Rick Levine will be teaching. Uh, Maurice Fernandez, Soul, uh, Jonathan, and we've got a bunch of other people as well that I'm looking forward to meeting. Uh, Ari Moshe, Timothy Holloran, and uh, Christina Claudel. So really brilliant astrologers, world-renowned astrologers, myself as well. I feel really grateful to be in such great company. But you can check out the schedule. Check out all the variations on pricing. The longer you wait, the price does go up significantly, but there's still really great discounts available. So I hope that you'll check that out. Astrology Rising, uh, CostaRica.com. Astrology Rising, CostaRica.com. Uh, is where all the information is. And I look forward to meeting you in Costa Rica. We won't be on a boat. We will be on land. And I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, and to just having fun and learning and growing together in this uh, resort experience that we're going to share. AstrologyRisingCostaRica.com after Costa Rica, I will head to Toronto. And it is going to be... Uh, in the middle of the month that I am going to be presenting and hosted by Astrology Toronto. So I hope uh, to meet you there, to see you there as well. If you're in the Toronto area, it'll be really nice to be home at that time. The following weekend is Memorial Day weekend, and I will be in Seattle at the NORWAC conference. And immediately after Memorial Day, or on Memorial Day, I'm gonna fly to Las Vegas the next day, the Tuesday after Memorial Day, and the last Saturday in May, I will be teaching in Las Vegas, hosted by the NCGR Stargazers Group of Las Vegas. I'm really looking forward to being back. I do love Vegas very much. And then I get a break and I uh, will be teaching in September, again in Colorado. 
I want to send a very, very big, very heartfelt thank you to everybody who participated in my charity raffle. Thank you so much for your donations. It really uh, meant so much to me. We raised so much money together and it has moved me very deeply. And I just thank you with all my heart. 933 tickets were sold at a dollar each and I promised you I would cover PayPal fees and I would add additional money so that we together would donate money and so a thousand dollars was donated to bestfriends.org they were the main charity that we were raising money for and bestfriends.org they specialize in rehabilitating rehoming uh, and bringing healing to animals who have experienced abuse or trauma. And they welcome in all kinds of animals and they really do very important work and work that affirms love and wisdom in the world. Work that affirms that no matter what it is you've been through, you will love again, you can love again, especially if you're willing to do the work. And so I absolutely love this organization. I donate to them every single month anyways, but now because of you, $1,000 was donated directly by me. And of course, as I shared with you before, uh, another organization as well, a company donated $1,000 as well. So thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, additionally, on our behalf, I also donated uh, $300 to an organization called JMM, Just Manifesting Miracles. They are in Lebanon, Oregon. They are a smaller organization, but they actually um, work as an adoption service to help animals get adopted, dogs specifically, I do believe. Uh, but I do think that as much as we look at these big uh, organizations like bestfriends.org and the very important work that they do, these smaller, more local organizations, they also do very valuable work right on the ground. And so on behalf of friends, fans, superstars, and students of NadiaShaw.com, uh, $300 was donated on your behalf, on our behalf. And I also wanted to donate something that was more astrologically specific as well. And most conferences do have scholarship funds that you can apply for, anybody can apply for. Uh, and normally if you go onto their website, you'll see those scholarship funds. Well, that money is raised for those scholarship funds through donations. And many, many years ago, I attended one of my first important, important conferences because of a scholarship many, many years ago, and it ended up meaning so much to me. And so on our behalf, Friends, fans, superstars, and students of NadiaShaw.com, I donated $200 to Norwalk and their uh, scholarship fund. And so, all together, we raised $1,500. And that, to me, is really incredible. And plus the $1,000 that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and that means that a whole lot of people, a whole lot of animals, um, a whole lot of students of astrology are going to be helped because of your generosity. So for buying a ticket, for supporting this initiative, you have my absolute gratitude uh, and my heartfelt thanks to you. Thank you. I have such a great life and it really is thanks to you and it's thanks to your love and it's thanks to your trust. And I never take that for granted ever. And I thank you so much for that. Thank you. And I think with that, that's it for now. I don't think there's a lot else to share. I do have special horoscopes, of course, that you can download on my website. They're free to superstars, decade ahead horoscope, year ahead horoscope, Jupiter uh, horoscope special. If you haven't already, please do check that out. And again, synchronicityuniversity.com. That's where the party is going to be for the next while. Uh, and so I look forward uh, to meeting you in class. And again, thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for sharing your sacred journey with me. I'm truly so grateful for it. It'll be a great week. Enjoy.